Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tucker Mabry. I'm the regional manager for the East Coast, and I am proud to introduce to you Dr. Lawrence Lautenberg. Uh, first, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to attend uh, Kirsten Lucas, who is our product manager uh, for the Riblock system, is on the phone as well. Everyone is in listen only mode, so you won't be able to ask any questions verbally until the end of the presentation. There is a chat mode where if you have some questions, and we have a little break in between slides that uh, we can ask your question to Dr. Lautenberg. At the end of the presentation, we'll be able to unmute everyone, and then you'll have to unmute yourself as well, and you'll be able to ask questions for about 10 or 15 minutes following the presentation. So Dr. Lautenberg comes to us currently at St. Mary's Medical Center in West Palm Beach, Florida, where he is the Director of Trauma Research and Education and he is a trauma and acute care surgeon. He has a plethora of accolades and a lot of experience in the rib fracture community. He has done over 450 cases over his career as a trauma surgeon in multiple facilities all across the United States. So he has a, a, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and he's gonna share some of that with us today and what he's learned over the years. So without further ado, Dr. Lautenberg, thank you very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Good day, everybody. Um, I have a couple of disclosures, as you can see. Um, and uh, as Tucker said, uh, you know, I've done a, a quite a large number of cases uh, using almost every system out there. Um, and I'll be talking to you today about some of the pitfalls and things that I've learned. Uh, my The objectives of my talk today is I wanted to briefly review the evidence-based medicine papers, which I think are probably the 10 papers that everybody ought to read about rib fracture fixation. I want to talk about the management of rib fractures 2018, talk to you a little bit about operative approaches, talk to you about some adjuncts to pain management that are new for 2018. Then I want to talk to you about the pitfalls of building rib fracture programs and the pitfalls in operative management. And I wanna finish by emphasizing the importance of having guidelines and protocols for uh, what we do. Uh, I thought what I would do is start with a case. This is an active case of a patient that is currently on our trauma service right now. And uh, it's quite a spectacular case. Uh, uh, and uh, I thought I'd uh, just show you this case. So this is a 55-year-old lady who uh, was drinking and was out and about in downtown West Palm Beach about a week ago, previously healthy, got hit by a car at a high rate of speed, and basically walked off the sidewalk and got hit. She was hypotensive on arrival to the trauma room. Uh, she was only a transient responder to fluids and uh, a couple of units of pack cells, and then she dropped her pressure precipitously. An MTP was initiated. She had crepitus and decreased breast sounds on both sides and had chest tubes placed. She had a positive fast and her blood pressure remained at 60 systolic uh, despite the massive transfusion. Uh, the OR was ready and uh, because she um, appeared to be um, uh, immovable at that time, a rebo was placed via right femoral percutaneous approach. She got to the OR 22 minutes later after the Roboa had been inflated with a systolic blood pressure of 110. Here is her uh, first chest X-ray. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of things I, I, I want to point out to you. Obviously, she was intubated immediately. Uh, you can see her right chest tube. And the first thing you see here on this right side of her chest is all of these rib fractures and all of this uh, uh, haziness in and her chest. The other thing you can see here is the Reboa balloon, which is blown up somewhere between zones one and three. Once the team noted that it was a little low, they deflated it and raised it up. But the other thing I want to point out to you, if you haven't already seen it, is this area here in her mediastinum. And uh, certainly uh, blowing up a Reboa with a chest x-ray like this uh, you're certainly taking uh, some form of risk. So her injuries uh, after she went to the OR and got scanned uh, were quite extensive. 
She had a bilateral hemoneumothorax. She had a massive hemoperitoneum on exploration with a grade five liver laceration of segments four, seven, and eight, a grade one splenic lac, and a minimal pelvic hematoma. She had a torn thoracic aorta, blowing up a Reboa for a torn thoracic aorta. That's something that could be discussed, which we won't today. And she had a right-sided radiologic flailed chest with multiple comminuted fractures of ribs two through 11. Additionally, she had a right mid-shaft humerus fracture, a right intertrochanteric hip fracture, an unstable shear fracture of T12, but no evidence of intracranial injuries. This was her CT scan, which shows the torn thoracic aorta here, and also these ribs, which scanning down further, you can see that they're markedly displaced, and atelectasis on both sides. This is her 3D reconstruction. I'll talk about 3D reconstruction a little later, but as you can see in the um, lateral to medial view, multiple comminuted rib fractures with flail, posterior, anterior, more than three fractures. And as you can see in the cephalad caudad view, a very unstable chest wall. Here are the operative procedures that this lady has had in the seven days that she's been with us. On the first day, she had a laparotomy, hepatography, splenography, damage control packing, and removal of the Reboa catheter. We left the uh, introducer in. Several hours later, she was bleeding. Her tag was normal, and we felt this was surgical bleeding. So she went back to the OR for repacking and more sutures in her liver. And now her pelvic hematoma was quite expansive, and she had preperitoneal pelvic packing. Several hours later, after that was performed, actually out of the OR, she went right up to IR for the vascular surgeons to place a stent in her aorta. Two days later, after stabilization and resuscitation, she went back to the operating room for a redo laparotomy, removal of 21 lap pads, more attention to the liver, attention to the spleen, which was left in, and argon and topical antifibrin anti things were put on it, and drainage of her uh, preperitoneal space and her abdomen was closed. Two days after that, orthopedics took her for a repair of her right intertrochanteric hip fracture and her right humerus fracture. Day after that, she went with spine surgery for a posterior spinal fusion of T7 through L3. And then last week on Friday, we brought her to the operating room for ORIF of ribs three through 10. We applied 13 plates, did an intercostal nerve block and intercostal nerve cryoablation. Today, she's awake and alert and following commands, neurologically intact. She's still on the ventilator, but she's weaning on pressure support. Her PF ratio this morning was 346. We expect her to be extubated in the next 12 to 24 hours and hopefully moved on her care path. This is her post-operative chest X-ray. We used 13 plates on her. We were unable to get the U-plate up on rib three, so you see what we did is we used a, a uh, U plate where we cut the U's off the plate and just did standard uh, anterior plating. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. This case kind of points out multimodality treatment of patients with rib fractures. And the reason why I brought this case was just to point out that it's not only about the plating, it's also about the patient. You can see her aortic stent graft, you can see her hardware for her uh, spine fusion as well. What's the problem? 400,000 patients a year in the United States have rib fractures. 30% or more have complications of the rib fractures themselves. The mortality of, of multiple rib fractures can be up to 20% in the elderly group. 60% of patients with rib fractures have long-term disability. And up to 60% of patients with flail chest never return to work because of the disability. Ribs are different. There's three types of bone, cortical, cancellous, and membranous. Cortical are your thick bones like the femur or the humerus. Cancellous bones like your skull that has fairly thick bone with a little bit of marrow but is thin. And ribs are membranous bones, thin cortex, a lot of marrow. So we have to deal with these thin cortical bones 
that fracture and splinter quite re re regularly. Now, as I said, I was gonna point out some evidence-based medicine. I'm gonna take us back and look at some of these papers. But if you go on PubMed and you put rib fracture fixation on PubMed, there are 522 citations all the way back to 1954. And that wasn't the first year that people wrote about rib fracture fixation. That's just the papers that are on PubMed. So when people say that there's not a lot of data and there's not a lot of good data, I'm sure that you could realize that out of these 522 citations, there's a decent amount of data and a fairly large number of patients that have been looked at for rib fracture fixation. Let's go back to 2002. This is a paper which is most often quoted. This is the Tanaka paper out of Japan. This is a group of Japanese trauma surgeons. And back in 2002, they looked at 37 intubated trauma patients in the same ICU and they randomized them on day five to fixation or not. The ISS and all the other injuries were basically the same. They easily showed that in the patients they fixed back in 2002, the incidence of pneumonia, the length of mechanical ventilation, the ICU stay, and the number of patients that wound up getting trached were significantly better in the fixated group. In addition to that, this is one of the first papers that looked at pulmonary function, FRC, and they also, this is a captive audience in Japan, that they were able to go back and question patients on chest tightness, pain, dyspnea, and do a quality of life assessment. And they looked at the number of patients that got back to full-time employment. No question, more patients got back to full-time employment after they were fixed. Now, the first thing that the naysayers are gonna say, small group, yeah, small group, but prospective randomized study. Here's another study from 2005, surgical versus conservative treatment of the flail chest, evaluation of pulmonary status. 40 patients with flail chest, 20 patients fixed, 20 patients had old fashioned plaster strapping or whatever. The fixated patients had much better pulmonary functions and also had much better results. Another paper, pulmonary function testing after operative stabilization of the flail chest, a prospective study, 66 patients with flail chest, looking at respiratory failure, progressive displacement of flail, failure to wean, and thoracotomy for other reasons. As you can see here in the picture, these were the old mandibular plates, which originally were used in the early 2000s to put on ribs. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the history of rib fracture fixation. Needless to say, it is, it is uh, quite interesting and fascinating. Uh, we're actually working on a paper now looking at rib fracture fixation all the way back to the early 1900s. But they looked at total lung capacity and you can see that it was well over predicted. My colleagues at Mass General did a uh, paper, Pain as an Indication for Rib Fracture Fixation, a bi-institutional study. This was retrospective, but they looked at the amount of opioids being used, and this was in 2011. And in the rib fracture fixation group, the opioid use was significantly lower. Going on with some more papers, and remember, the papers I'm showing you today, I would say, these are the papers you want to look at. So the, the question was in, the, in, in 2016, what, what are people saying about rib fracture fixation? Well, a consensus group got together of experts who have done all of the, all of the authors on this paper have done over 100 cases in 2016. And this was a consensus statement on the surgical stabilization of rib fractures as a colloquium. And here are some of the conclusions. Rip fracture fixation could be, should be considered in all patients with flail chest. They should all, it should also be considered in patients with multiple severe bicortical displaced fractures. It should be considered in patients who fail early optimal non-operative management regardless of the fracture pattern. 
pulmonary contusion should not be an absolute contraindication. Patients with pulmonary contusion should be evaluated on an individual basis. TBI should not be an absolute contraindication. Patients with TBI evaluated on an individual basis. These authors felt that within 72 hours was the optimal timing. Also, these authors concluded, which many of us have concluded, you don't need to fix ribs one and two. They're difficult to access. They're difficult to fix. And you don't need to fix 11 and 12. They don't offer any additional uh, benefit. The other thing that this paper points out for the first time is you got to fix every fracture. You shouldn't leave any fractures. I have, I have learned this from bitter experience that if you decide, well, I can't get back to that rib or I can't get up to that rib and you don't fix that rib, the patient's going to come back to your outpatient office and complain of pain right at that site. There's a lot of other things that this paper talked about as far as the colloquium and how the plate should be placed, and we'll get into that shortly. Hospitals managing patients with rib fractures should develop protocols for local regional pain control. We'll talk about that. Patients should be placed on scheduled pain regime after fixation to include the scheduled non-narcotic-based analgesics, muscle relaxants, local regional anesthesia, and manual splinting. Specific coexisting injuries that frequently in influence operating planning are spine fractures and pulmonary contusion. Spine fractures because of, dis of dislocating the spine when the patients turn. So we have to think about that. Posterior fractures would occur with maybe approach from the prone position. And we'll talk about that when we talk about exposures. So this paper is just full of great suggestions. Now, the next thing that happened is in 2018, several of us did a, 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 a survey of what we thought we should do with patients without flail chest. And the purpose was that there's no currently evidence-based indications for stabilization of rib fractures. There is level one data on stabilization for flail chest, and we'll show you some of that. So we, we got together and we did sort of a um, Delphi sort of uh, analysis, and we looked at patients that had three or more continuous displaced, displaced defined as less than 50% fractures that were anatomically amenable to repair. The patients were currently not intubated. They had not undergone laparotomy or thoracotomy. They had not undergone craniotomy. They did not have a severe pulmonary contusion based on scoring, no spinal cord injuries, and no other comorbidities. 30 respondents provided a total of 540 answers. The majority of the response were in favor of rib fracture fixation for non-flail chest. The decision to recommend varies significantly by the number of abnormal clinical variables. The most appropriate cutoff for equipoise appeared to be in a patient's age 21 to 79 with no or mild TBI greater than two abnormal pulmonary parameters based on pulmonary function tests, regardless of the fracture location. The conclusion was that Rib fracture fixation was recommended for most patients with non-flail displaced rib fractures. However, it was contingent upon age, degree of TBI, and pulmonary clinical status. Let's talk a little bit about where we are with rib fracture ma management in 2018. I think it's not just about the plating. It's about the initial trauma st stabilization. It's about making the diagnosis in the trauma bay and establishing pulmonary compromise earlier. And it's about early pain management. And there's a lot of things going on with pain management right now. IV analgesia with opioids or non-opioids, NSAIDs, and now ketamine infusion. And ketamine infusion in a low dose has been shown to replace opioid infusions very well in rib fracture fixation. Intercostal blocks with liposomal bivocaine have, has, is starting to become popular. Epidurals and paravertebrals from our anesthesia colleagues, very important. The one caution I would say about epidurals is a pitfall. Avoid epidurals in those early first 12 to 24 hours after trauma, especially if the patient is not hemodynamically stable. 
and avoid epidurals in the elderly if they're if they're dehydrated because you will have problems with their hemodynamics. Place some of on cue catheters by surgeons. And then finally, cryoablation is starting to take, take, take hold very well. Cryoablation can be done during rib fracture fixation or it could be done exclusive of rib fracture fixation thoracoscopically in patients that don't have indications to have their ribs fixated. In the OR, Double lumen tubes, bronchial blockers are totally optional. Full lateral decubitus, prone and supine positions. Placing the arm as high up as you can safely to open up the area under the axilla. Doing a full thoracotomy, prone positioning and muscle sparing are important. Using a self-retaining retractor like a Codman Buckwalter or a Thompson retractor with medium or long body sidewall blade on the scapula really helps. Starting with ribs five, six, and seven, and then working superiorly and inferiorly so that you can get under the scapula and work down. I really emphasize that we must wash the chest out at the end of every case. Therefore, through the previous chest tube site, through the thoracotomy site, thoracostomy site, you can place a suction and a, and a bulb syringe and wash the chest out that way. You can place a thoracoscope and wash the chest out that way. If the pleura is violated, which it is almost 100% of the time, you need to place a chest tube before you leave the operating room. If you use pain catheters, you can place them in the paravertebral space, or you can block intercostally with a liposomal bivocaine. The liposomal bivocaine, it's expiral, um, will give you up to 72 hours of pain relief if you block ribs three through nine. or you can cryoablate either thoracoscopically or you can cryoablate on the outside as well by cryoablating the ribs using the Atricure cryoablation system. Now, just a few words about technology. As I mentioned to you, I've used them all. I've, I've seen them all work. They all work well. I'm sort of laying down on right now the um, um, acute innovations um, U-plate system. And I like the U-plate system because of several reasons, which I'm going to point out to you. The first reason is, is that the plate fits over the top of the rib. So you only have to clean two areas on the top of the rib. You don't have to disrupt the intercostal bundle, which I'll show you in a later slide. The next thing is, is that it only requires two screws on each side and there is plate, cortex, cortex to plate attachment. This places the entire plate directly in the center of the rib 100% of the time. Now, if somebody was to design the ideal plating system, we would want a plating system which uses a minimal number of screws, which gets the plate exactly in the anterior portion of the rib, which causes the least amount of trauma to the intercostal bundle, which reduces the rib as compression occurs so that we don't have to skeletonize the rib, and which is all power. So the nice thing about this system right now, while it doesn't suit every single one of those things I outlined in my ideal design of a system, the compression is done by power. As you compress the rib, it will automatically stop once there's rib to rib compression and give you a color coded depth. So you don't have to measure anything with calipers. You don't have to pick a certain length of screw. As you can see here, this one stopped at the, what looks like the blue dot. So you go with the blue drill and the blue screw. That's a, approximately an eight millimeter screw. The drill has a ceramic guide on it, which puts the drill bit directly in the center of the screw hole. And it is also power. And that same drill bit 
can be interchanged with the hex screwdriver to drive the screw. And then the guides will come off and the plate will be right in the middle. And I'll show you that in a subsequent slide. Here is an 89 year old lady that we did who was in a motor vehicle crash that was absolutely unmanageable with any kind of pain medicine without putting her basically in coma and had severely displaced ribs um, and uh, some plates there. Here is a gentleman who had chronic non-union and some hardware failure that replaced bone grafts to bridge his non-union. And as you can see, not only did we put the screws in the compression plates, we added screws in the bone graft, which we harvested from his iliac crest. We were also able to use where we needed to a completely straight plate. And we were also able to easily contour the plate in a curved fashion using the benders. Here's a, another patient who wound up with bilateral flail chest who we repaired. How we do this um, is completely optional based on the patient's status. Uh, I have on occasion done both sides in the same sitting. This one we did one side one day, and came back two days later and did the other side because of the patient's cardiovascular status. So you can see how the plates are contoured as well. Here's a view using the um, Codman Buckwalter retractor and as you notice here, this ring that we're using is the large bariatric ring, which can be obtained from the company. Um, it has a, a, an eponym name on it. It is called the Vogel, V-O-G-E-L, Ang ring. It was a design made at the University of Florida when I was there. And I also use an extra long post so I don't have to put the uh, extension on the post. That can also be obtained. And what this is showing um, is uh, the plates going in, and this is actually a plate all the way up on the second rib, and it's very rare that I would ever do a rib to. However, this second rib was uh, completely compressed into the lung and actually lacerated the lung, and I felt if I could get to this rib, I could elevate it up and get it out of the lung, and we were able to do that quite successfully. Now again, you know, when you turn the patient, I'm going to show you some more slides about positioning. Um, you want to make sure that um, you can get good exposure. We want to try and do a minimal incision. However, if you have somebody with three to 10 and a bad flail posteriorly and anteriorly, it's going to be very difficult to do that through a minimal incision. Yes, you could use two separate incisions. I kind of prefer doing a standard thoracotomy incision. Um, this one, I had muscle splitting because it was difficult to get full exposure, but most of the time we use muscle sparing and dividing. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about pitfalls. I thought one of the pitfalls I would talk about is how to build a program for some of you out there that are starting your programs or interested in building a program. I actually have had the experience of building programs in three separate types of trauma centers. So the first program I built was at an academic level one trauma center, and that was at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, I had the honor of being the trauma medical director there for about 10 years. The way I started rib plating was way back in 2006 and 2007. I was doing exposures for the neurosurgeons, and oftentimes I had to do an osteotomy to divide the rib above and the rib below of the inner space that they needed if they needed to put in multiple cages for corpectomies. And I kept looking at these divided ribs, which I divided posteriorly, and I said to myself, I ought to put these ribs back together. At that time, the only system available was the rib lock system, which was developed by John Mayberry and Acute Innovations uh, out in Oregon. And we started using the rib lock system uh, to uh, repair these osteotomies. Then we started looking at available data. Then I became um, uh, very friendly with John Mayberry, who was doing a, most of his cases out west. And uh, we talked and we sat down and we said, okay, let's see what we can start putting together. And the rest is kind of history. 
Um, we did chest wall reconstruction after thoracotomy for blunt and penetrating trauma. Shortly uh, thereafter in 2010, the Synthi system became available. We started with flail chests. We had a robust anesthesia pain program and a pain fellowship. So we we're able to get our blocks done. We enlisted interested partners in our, in our work, including anesthesia, including other trauma surgeons. And we were fortunate in that area in North Florida that we had a huge population of equestrian, farm, ranch, and motorcycle injuries that provided us with hundreds of cases for rib fracture fixation. The one thing we learned very quickly was vendor rep training in the OR, and the vendor should probably be present from start to finish on every case. The cardiothoracic surgeons became interested and we started working with them. The trauma orthopedic surgeons became interested and we set up a rotation for the trauma orthopedic fellows to come and le learn how to do that. And actually one of those trauma orthopedic fellows is the only orth trauma sur is the only surgeon in uh, Southwest Florida that does rib, rib reconstruction to this day. We trained all our residents and our fellows. We trained our junior partners. We started using zip ties and zip fix for sternal closure and clamshell closure, and we became a referral center. In the first five years, we did 180 cases. We looked at getting a geriatric rib fracture center off, and then we said, you know what? We gotta publish our data. So we published our first 81 cases, and looking at a multidisciplinary rib fracture management pro protocol that included operative fixation, and we looked at the safety and impact on patient outcomes. We showed that there was unadjusted lower mortality in the fixation group than in the non-operative group, and we showed that there were better ventilator days. After this, I transitioned uh, to uh, working in a community level two trauma center in uh, Northern Indiana. The trauma center was one of six hospitals in a big trauma system. It was an ACS verified level two trauma center. It was a full service hospital and we got all the referrals from this area. There was an established trauma service with experienced surgeons, but nobody had any experience in rib plating. CT surgery called for flail and rib fractures. However, once we looked at everything and looked back on everything, we saw that only one in 10 of the operative candidates were actually plated by the CT surgeons. It was a large population of industrial workers farming and Amish. And as you know, the Amish, um, they don't ride in motorized vehicles. They ride in buggies on the main roads. These buggies are constantly being hit by vehicles. And there was a huge number of patients coming in uh, with multiple rib fractures. We presented all our data to the trauma team. We did a trauma grand rounds with CT and anesthesia present. And we did a keynote presentation at, an, at the annual trauma symposium. We then got the vendor to train us we met with CT surgery and CT surgery finally said, okay, you guys go ahead. We'll be there if you need us, we'll be with you. And uh, there was no anesthesia pain program. So we went to OnQ. We did one-on-one -on -one training in the OR for all six trauma surgeons. The OR personnel got engaged. And as the patients got back to work and play, everybody became very, very engaged. So then I moved in my retirement, believe it or not, down to South Florida where I grew up and where I worked down here for 26 years and trained down here. And I became involved with the Level One Trauma Center in West Palm Beach, uh, which is in the center of the Knife and Gun Club of West Palm Beach, 25% uh, penetrating trauma, but also a high volume of boating, fishing, and motorcycles and recreation vehicles and a high volume of high-speed motor vehicle crashes. There's also a high volume of substance abuse and distracted driving. This played a role in our ability to provide pain control for patients with rib fractures. We are eight trauma surgeons. We all do trauma, vascular, chest, and general surgery. Our trauma medical director started the trauma center 25 years ago. Five of the surgeons have an average of 10 years at this hospital. Two of our recent uh, uh, partners had fellowships. One was from a rib plating program and one was from a non-rib plating program. There was interest in rib plating by the partners, but none had been done. So we presented the data, lectures again. There are two state-of-the-art training sites within driving distance of our trauma center. We took advantage of both of them. 
We did a training course for the entire team, including the OR techs and the physician extenders. I mentored and assisted on every single case, which I still do to this day. We have vendor rep training in the OR and the vendor rep is in the OR on every case. We don't have an anesthesia pain team, so we use OnQ and we've done 90 cases or more in the last three years. And now recently we've become affiliated with a university training program at Florida Atlantic University. And we have surgical residents doing their trauma rotation at our institution and we're training them as well. So a couple of ways of doing this, I'm sure I've kind of pointed out to you being in all kinds of different institutions, how you can do this. Uh, I'm more than happy at a later time uh, to uh, expand more on this. Let me talk to you about pitfalls in operative management. And I think that this is fairly important. There's a great paper, and again, these papers in this presentation are the papers that I say you gotta read. This paper was done by Bob Serrani and Jose Diaz. Bob is at uh, Washington Center and, uh, at Shock, and uh, Jose is at Shock Trump. They wrote a paper about pitfalls associated with rib fracture fixation. And the interesting thing is the, the preface in the paper, rib fracture fixation is exceedingly, rib fracture is exceedingly common. And as I pointed out about the death rate, it can be up to 20%. Patient selection is very important. And the one thing you want to do when you select patients is if patients are in respiratory failure, are they in respiratory failure because you are unable to control their pain or in their respiratory failure because they have massive pulmonary contusions or they've gone into ARDS? So you really got to separate that. Or have you waited too long and they already have pneumonia? A study of over 400 patients found no benefit to rib fracture fixations and severe pulmonary contusion. And these are all referenced uh, papers in their paper. And you really should look at this. Rarely they can present in delayed fashion with pain due to non-union, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Let's talk about some pitfalls of imaging and localization of, of fractures. You gotta be careful when you look at the CT. And I am very big on emphasizing you need a 3D reconstruction uh, CT to be able to fully understand where you're going to operate and what ribs you're going to operate on and how you're going to repair them. You need to use the scapula as a landmark. And when possible, manual palpation of the chest in the operating room becomes very important. You cannot fully believe in what you see on CT or on chest x-ray. Because as you move these patients into position, these fractures shift and they dis dislocate quite, quite regularly. If you look at positioning and exposure, the use of a self-retaining retractor can be helpful to assist with exposure. And in this paper, in general, a horizontal incision along the dermatome is preferable to a vertical incision, but I'm gonna show you some slides about different, different uh, exposures. So if, if you looked at this, and these slides I borrowed from one of my colleagues, Dr. Griffenstein, and uh, they are excellent slides. So you can do a standard anterior lateral or posterior lateral thoracotomy, muscle dividing or muscle sparing. You can also do a vertical incision right over rib fractures if all the rib fractures are in a straight line. And you can do a vertical posterior incision in the prone position. So let's take a look here at what we've got here. If you put the patient prone, you'll notice the trapezius muscle is here, the scapula is here, and as you put the arm out, the scapula distracts. So you can get all of these muscles moved out of the way and you can get into what's called the oscillatory triangle and come right down on the ribs if you make your incision right there. And interesting enough, this is a cadaver model showing that oscillatory triangle through that vertical incision. And as you can see here, you have the, the back of the lat is up, you have the erectors here and you're right down on the rib cage. And in this position, in the prone position, you can really get great, great exposure. What about anatomical 
considerations. The fracture must be reduced directly using bone clamps, a right angle clamp, or your fingers. The interesting thing is, with the U-plate system, as you compress the plate, fractures do reduce themselves. However, overlapping ribs, overlapping fractures, need to be mobilized to be able to be reduced. The thin cortex necessitates any plate can be fixed to both cortex with locking screws. A potential benefit of the U-plates is the screws are fixed to the cortices of the bone as well as the plate itself. The section of the periosteum should be minimized because U-plates are fixed anteriorly and posteriorly, fewer screws are needed to anchor. Other, other plating systems require three screws, anteriorly some require four screws. If using an anterior plating system, care should be taken to ensure the plate is positioned over the center of the rib. Hold that thought for a minute. One of the key benefits of the procedure is that this is not a thoracotomy. This is an exposure prior to doing a thoracotomy. So here's what I wanted to show you about these anterior plates. When you're using anterior plates, you've got to be careful that you position that anterior plate right over the center of the rib because if the plate gets off to the side, sometimes the screws can come out the back end of the plate too long. Sometimes they can splinter here and you need to be extremely careful. The thing that I've noticed with these U plates, as I mentioned to you before, the plate almost every single time drives onto the center of the rib automatically as long as you get the compression U plate to bone. Now let's look down here. This is a cross section of a human rib. As you can see here, the rib is kind of oblong shaped. So here are the different methods. You can use the U plate, which will go threaded to the plate, threaded to the anterior cortex, threaded to the posterior cortex, and threaded to the plate. You can use an anterior plating system, which are threaded to the plate, threaded to the cortex, anteriorly, and threaded to the posterior cortex. Or you can use an anterior plate, which is unicortical and has oblong plates, oblong screws, oblique screws, to try and just get that single cortex. So you have choices here. I'm, I'm very, very happy with this U system plate. Now, what about pitfalls in post-operative care? The use of local regional intraoperative rib blocks with long acting analgesics with regional anesthesia can improve post-operative pain. And I'll talk a little bit as we finish up here about exactly what I mean by that. I put a chest tube in 100% of the time. I've gone from a 36 to a 32 to a 28 to a 20, and now I'm down to a 19 round Blake drain. And that's all I put in the chest, but I do drain the chest. I drain the chest for several reasons. There will be serosanguinous fluid, effluent, I don't want to have to deal with a post-operative pleural effusion. I also want to make sure that I don't create a pneumothorax post-operatively. And I also make sure that when I put my drains in, I try and keep them away from the plates. There's a wonderful monograph which just came out that was done by Dr. DeMoya and Dr. Mayberry. And there's multiple authors of people that you know who, are, uh, who have written chapters in this. Chapter 14 in this rib fracture management book is on post-operative complications after rib fracture fixation done by Ram Narula, who does a tremendous amount of work in uh, Arizona. Um, one, of the, one of the things in this chapter was this interesting uh, table, uh, which came from another paper. And it showed things like wound infection, hardware infection, empyema, chest tightness, chronic pain, and hardware migration. I want you to pay attention to wound infection, hardware infection, and hard, hardware migration. These things are almost non-existent. Um, as Tucker told you, I've done several, many hundred cases 
I've not had more than one very serious deep wound infection where I had to take the patient back to the OR, open the wound, drain the deep surgical site infection. I elected to leave the plates, keep the wound open. I vac the patient. I did not have to explant the plates. I have never had to explant plates for infection, although there are some odd, unusual reports of plates getting infected and needing to be explanted. I've had hardware failure. This occurs. It's very, very, very low incidence. Hardware migration. Um, people use, uh, uh, some people still use those intramedullary splints. Those splints can migrate. I would caution against using those splints uh, at this time and stick to anterior plates. There was another paper that was published and is quoted in this chapter, Operative Management of Rib Fractures in the Setting of Flail Chest, a Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis by the group out of Washington University. Um, although the paper is several years old, I highly recommend you look at this patient paper. As compared to non-operative therapy, operative fixation of uh, flail chest is associated with reductions in, in length of stay, mortality, and complications. This is a meta-analysis. It goes over almost every paper that's relevant to this. These findings support the need of an adequately powered clinical study to define the role of this intervention. It, it has come on flail chest and it's there. Currently, there is an excellent study, ongoing multi-center study, looking at non-flail chest, and we hope to have those results in the next 12 to 18 months. So as I finish up, you got to have a protocol. you got to have guidelines that make sense. Guidelines should not miss patients who may benefit from this procedure, and guidelines should not overuse the procedure. I think if you looked at every paper that's available now, your window of opportunity for the safest, easiest uh, operation is within 48 hours of the injury. As you saw in the case I presented, we did our, our operation in seven days for obvious reasons. Relief of pain, yes. Return to activity as soon as possible, you bet. Incision size, is it an issue, not an issue? It's Incision size, it should be an issue, but if you have to make a larger incision, I have not found that to be an issue with the patients. Wound infection, I have not found to be an issue. Looking at what we do at our trauma center, just to give you a little bit of what we do, obviously, A, B, C, Ds, and Es, we look for the chest X-ray right away. On chest X-ray, we're looking for that hemoneumothorax, sub-Q emphysema, obvious deformity in the chest wall or rib fractures. On awake patients, we get an eye and the center spirometer at the bedside. We're looking for the patient that can't pull 750 or less than 10 cc's a kilo. We get a pain scale calculated. And then when we go for CT, if there's three or more rib fractures, everybody gets a 3D reconstruction. You really cannot decide what you need to do and how you're going to do it without the 3D reconstruction. You want to decide on displacement. You want to decide on overlapping. You want to decide on comminution. You want to decide how high to go and how low to go. You want it in two planes so that you can see how your reduction needs to be. Obviously, this backside of these ribs, you can't move these once you local, once you try and and get a reduction. You're only going to be able to move this side, so you have to emphasize moving this side. But you need to see how much reduction you need to make. If the patient goes to the floor, the step-down unit or the ICU, they're always assessed for other injuries. TBI is very important to us. If there's a TBI and the patient has an ICP monitor or their Glasgow is less than 12, we tend to say as a group, let's hold off on doing anything. We start IV analgesia immediately. We start PCA immediately. We get them in the pain algorithm and we decide, are we gonna use IV acetaminophen? Are we gonna use a ketamine drip? Are we gonna use IV PCA with dilaudid or fentanyl? We review the CT and the patient status immediately the next morning or that evening at team sign out. And we do this as a team. We look at the patient's IS volume, the pain scale, overlapping, flail segments, deformed chest wall. We then decide if the fracture is too far posterior or too anterior for us to want to do anything. We decide can we easily plate anything between 
three and 10, we don't do 11. And we make that operative decision within 24 to 48 hours if there are no other contraindications. For us, it's not just about the plating, it's about the stabilization and making that diagnosis and that pain management, which I've gone over with you. But it's not only about the ICU patient with flail chest. It's not only about the intubated patient. It's more about the non-intubation patient with minimal injuries or no other injuries who's in pain despite everything that we're trying to do. And it's also for me what the patient does for life and living. It's about getting the patient back to pre-injury work and leisure activity. For me, it's about doing the right thing. And for me, it's not about who should we plate, but when should we plate when we decide to plate. Now, I know that there are some recent papers about quality of life. You gotta talk to patients. You gotta look at patients. You gotta show the patients their scans and you gotta make a decision on how you wanna get this patient back to their pre-injury status. I also think you don't wanna wait for that ideal or easy case. You always need to get a 3D scan. You need to talk to the patients and the family and show them their ribs in three dimensions and tell them about the outcomes. You need to have brochures created. Some of the vendors do have brochures that you can hand out. And I usually take the, bro the uh, brochures showing the pictures of all the plates and what's gonna be done. I try and plate as early as I can. Again, TBI, pelvic fractures, abdominal injuries, you got to consider everything. I believe we should all take a course, we should all become a mentor, and we should all teach a course. It only gets us better. Plate every rib from 3 to 10. Be meticulous about the skin, sub-Q, and muscle hemostasis. Wash out the chest, leave a small chest tube. As far as intercostal nerve analgesia, the Atricure company, which has been the company that uses cryoablation for atrial fibrillation, has developed a probe which can be placed through a thoracoscope, through a trocar thoracoscopically, or be used externally for us to cryoablate intercostal nerves. And you can cryoablate nerves three through nine. It takes two minutes per nerve at minus 36 degrees to cryoablate the nerve. Again, you wanna have the vendor in the room. The relief of pain for cryoablation usually doesn't start until 48 to 72 hours post ablation, but it lasts for three months. And there are more and more reports now looking at cryoablation in conjunction with rib fractures, in conjunction with rib fractures not fixed and rib fractures fixed. So in addition to cryoablation, I am also injecting liposomal bibucane. I usually take a 20 cc vial, dilute it to 50 cc's with 30 cc's of saline, and I inject two or three cc's in each rib's intercostal nerve from three down to 10. This provides pain relief from the operating room to about 72 hours. So I think in combination with these two modalities, we can get very good intercostal nerve analgesia for our patients. I think the learning curve for rib fracture fixation is probably about five or 10 cases. And I always, always, no matter if it's day or night, I always have the vendor in the room for every single case. It makes it so much easier. The vendor sets the case, sets the scrub tech, sets the circulator and gets everything done. And the vendors are very, very aggressive about wanting to come in the operating room. It's been a very exciting time. Before I leave, I can't leave without a commercial. For those of you that are not members of the Chest Wall Injury Society, I encourage you to go on this website and look. Uh, our society started uh, approximately two and a half years ago. Uh, it came out of uh, two consensus meetings that Dr. Tom White uh, started uh, at uh, Intermountain and uh, put a bunch of people together who were doing a lot of rib fracture fixation. It's now blossomed into a society of over 160 members. We have our annual meeting coming up in March. Uh, you can go on the site and register for the meeting. You can bring cases to the meeting. We also have a fascinating blog that's uh, private to the members of, of the society that you can put your cases on. 
and discuss cases with all of the various experts. Um, I really encourage you to get involved uh, in this society and to uh, network with all of us. We're all happy to help you. Uh, again, here's the website and uh, don't forget about the meeting. I thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy that my dog has been sitting next to me the whole time and has not barked once. So um, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lautenberg. That was a great presentation. Uh, Kirsten, if we can go ahead and unmute everyone and if anybody has any questions uh, for Dr. Mm -hmm. Lautenberg, uh, please unmute yourself as well. And uh, we've got a few minutes. Well, Dr. Lautenberg, again, thank you very much for your time and for your, your very, very well put together presentation. I think everybody got a lot out of that. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, could they reach out to you directly? Would you mind going back to your very first slide to just show your contact, your contact information if anyone has any uh, additional information or additional oh, questions? Okay. There, there it is. And, and I am more than happy to entertain phone calls, text messages, emails, anytime, anytime. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, that'll conclude today's webinar, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. And if you have any questions or require any service, please reach out to us. Thank you very much.